Father, it is a pleasure to be with your people. It is a pleasure to be around people who love you as much as the people of New Holland do. And I thank you for um, how Janice played the piano tonight in love and Jim standing beside her playing the bass. And even when Mark was over on the organ, it comes from a heart that overflows. And Lord, I call that worship. I, I, I am grateful, oh God, when, when because we are your people, the children who know your voice, we want to react to you in every aspect of our life. And Lord, everything that we do, we want to have a, a heavenward focus, but an earthly use. So Lord, just uh, bless us tonight. Father, may we not be about Bible study. May we be about Bible doing. May we not be about hearing about what Moses said, but Holy Spirit, may we be hearing what you have to say for us tonight. Lord, as it changed them, change us. Father, we are as much in need as they were in that day, and you're the same God. So, Father, I pray that tonight you will speak, speak um, personally, plainly, clearly, but Lord, when you speak and there is an ability to, to put your finger on our heart to, that actually can create the grace of change, Father, please do that tonight. May we once again be encouraged and, and leave this place different than when we came in. Father, until we see you face to face, may we take up the mantle of being about your business with all of our heart so mind and strength. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Deuteronomy, and we're going to look in chapter 6, but we're actually going to look a little bit in chapter uh, 4 and 5, because I want you to hear a little bit of what God told Moses, that Moses turned around and told the people as God told them to. Now, I'm always a scattered preacher, but I'm going to use a little scattered in my looking, looking at the scripture tonight. I'm going to highlight a few things, and uh, I'm going to hopefully pray that the Holy Spirit will just, without me having to say too much about them, just let the word speak for itself and remind you what the word says. Are you in Deuteronomy 4? Say amen. amen. Oh, by the way, if you don't give a high five tonight, Bradley says you owe $5 to the offering plate. So we won't have plenty of high fives. Amen. <laughs> Look at Jim up here. <laughs> All right. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, O Israel, listen. And the Shema means to hear. So here we see it even in chapter 4. Listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. The tense is every day in present tense. It means something that he stated in present tense then, but would have a continual effect. As you're walking through it, it would constantly be in present tense. I got saved when I was 10, but God's been constantly in my life, working in my life, moving me forward. Uh, he is constantly with me, and however long he keeps me here, he will continue to do that active present tense work in my life so he says i'm going to teach you to observe them and some lessons are harder to learn than others some lessons are best learned by failure is that fair some lessons we're not going to learn simply as we are shouting of the praises of god on the top of the mountain some lessons we're going to learn by how we stumble some lessons are going to be learned by we pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off and thank God that it was not worse and tell the Lord that we won't do that again. Do any of you have any of those issues with your children? Right? Why would God be any different with us? So he says, I'm going to teach you to observe them. Here's the key. Not just hearing them, but doing them. Knowing them is one thing. Living them is another. There are more people who know about God than are doing the works of God. I, 
I am becoming more and more bothered by how well attended is church Bible study and how less has been being done in church Bible doing. We know so much more than we're seeking to live out. So what God is trying to say is, other than letting me just convey information to you, let's make sure that we know that, that this is something that needs to be actively involved in your life. You're going forward, and, and God knows the battles that are there before they're, before they're even seeing them. This is our sovereign God who sees tomorrow before today. This is the sovereign God who knows all of the things of time. But he meets with us in the right now. So he's doing a work with us to help us in the right now. But, <laughs> excuse me, but it's forming an active work for what we're going to be facing tomorrow. I know. That when I sleep tonight, my Lord prays for me. And when I face whatever I will face tomorrow, my God will be with me as I go through them. But he has already said that nothing is going to come against me that he hasn't already looked at, prayed over, and nothing is, is that he will not be with me and be active in, in that particular part of my life. So our God, who is he, he knows how to get us from where we are to where we need to be. From the land of Egypt to the promised land. So he's going to teach them all those things as they're on the journey in. He's reminding them ahead of time. Look in verse 5. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act accordingly to them in the land which you go to possess. I'm teaching you these things because they're precepts and principles of life. You're going to get there, and you're going to say, what do we do? And the first thing you need to do is learn to what God's already taught you. Act upon that. That's the greatest thing we do. So many, so many people will come, and they'll say, Pastor, what do we do? And I'll say, well, what we need to do is what we already know God's told us to do. And over the next months, when we look at our high five, when we look at the core values that New Holland has already stated in its mission statement, what we're going to be looking is this is what we've already said that God's taught us that we know. How are we going to put that into Bible doing in our active walk of life? How is this going to affect everything that we're doing? Look in verse 9, chapter 4. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself. Diligently. Diligently be looking at these things, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Diligently keep yourself. You don't need me to chase you around. You've got the Holy Spirit with you. We know what we're supposed to do. It's just a matter of, are we going to choose to do those things? And one of the best ways that we learn these things is by showing them to someone else. Look at the end of verse 9. Teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Can I get an amen? Look, can, it's just us tonight, so I'm going to just share a word with you. I'm not trying to be rude to parents. I, I'm really not. But if, you're, if, if your children are not teaching your grandchildren, step over It is absolutely essential that your grandchildren know. And I know you did your best to teach your children. But for whatever reason in their season of life, if they're not teaching your grandchildren the way you taught them, you make sure they hear. All that you can. It says here very plainly, teach them to your children and then expect your children to teach your grandchildren. Is that what it says in verse 9? Teach them to your children and grandchildren. We'll talk more about that when we get to chapter 6. Um, verse 15. Take careful heed to yourselves. For you saw no form which the Lord spoke to you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire lest you act corruptly and make for yourself a carved image in the form of any figure 
the likeness of male or female. And he goes on to talk about that. When he says, take careful heed to yourself, he's saying, make sure there are no idols in your life. None. None. We need to take a constant inventory of the things that are close to our heart. And if there's anything in our lives that's become closer to us than God, we need to surrender it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When he says, take careful heed, when I do my taxes, I'm careful. I'm really careful. Matter of fact, I use uh, a software into it, TurboTax. Y'all can tell me how wrong I am for doing that if you want to. But I, 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 I like hitting that button where it says that it's going to review it for me. I want to make sure that I put everything in there exactly right. Because this might not be right. Y- 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 so there are things in my life that will slip in that I didn't mean to. And it happens to y'all too because I've gotten some of your text. And you didn't take careful heed before you hit sin. We need to take careful heed in our life. If there's anything, I'm going to say it again, anything that has grown close to your heart that is now a rival to God, we need to watch it, know it, And if we have a problem in giving it up, that tells you how close it's come to your heart. If you have to argue with God about if it's right or not, that should tell you. You probably need to do something. In verse 24 of chapter 4, he says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. A consuming fire will burn it up. Either you take that idol that you've allowed to get close to your heart and lay it down at the feet of Christ or expect it to get burned up. Is this an oh me sermon? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Look what it says in verse 35. To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other beside him. He's jealous. He doesn't want any rivals at all in our life. Verse 39, Therefore know this day and consider it in your heart that the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. I heard, uh, I saw on uh, Facebook, Franklin Graham had said that the greatest need that America has today is a relationship with God. I'll make it even closer to heart than that. There is no need in the church today other than a closer walk with God. Well, let's get into chapter 5. In chapter 5, Moses calls them all together. and He reminds them of the Ten Commandments. And he reminds them that God called them to Mount Horeb together. And he reminds them that they... They heard the voice of God. Can I, can I, can I throw in a, in, in the Old Testament, it, there, there's a word that comes up every now and again, uh, Shema. Uh, I, I said that wrong. It's not Shema. What's the one that's all the way through um, Psalms? Oh, good gracious. Selah. Thank you. They both started with the same letter. Selah. And the word Selah means wow. What do you think about that? And when I, when I think about that, and I think about how they were there and they saw the mountain on fire and the, the cloud of God was there. You would have, you would have, you would have wanted to get out the, your cell phone and take a picture of it because that's something you would have never wanted to forget. Amen? And to hear the voice of God. It came to the people when, and, and Moses is saying, we're supposed to go. We can't get so close. We can't get up on the mountain. But, but, but he, God's calling us there. And they're like, no, no, Moses, you go. We, we don't want to get too close to this. They saw the awesome presence of God. You would think that that would have been something that would have gotten their attention to the point that they would have never wanted to flee. But it's kind of like in Matthew 28 this morning, when when they're going up there to hear the the Great Commission, it said they saw him, but some doubted. 
Isn't it amazing in us that, that we are impacted by a holy, magnificent God that we have, but yet even then there will be a part of our heart that will still doubt. Now, don't get down too far down on yourself. God made us this way, and we're never going to be that, be fully what we're supposed to be until we get to heaven. All right? Let me say that again. We're always going to strive and struggle with the difficulties uh, of a heart not fully yielded to him now. But the calling of God is that we yield our heart fully to him. We'll never fully know it until we get to heaven. So he's reminded them of that. And I want to get to chapter 6 so fast, but, but look, I, I want you to hear verse 27. They told him, you go near and hear all that the Lord our God may say. And tell us all that the Lord our God says to you. And we will hear it, listen to me now, we'll hear it and do it. It's like they were almost saying, preacher, you go and you get with God. And, and whatever God tells you, you come and you tell us. And we promise you, preacher, we'll do it. Amen? Well, verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. What a word from God. What an awesome. He's going to look at New Holland tonight and say, oh, that they had a, such a heart in them that they would fear me, reverence me, be in awe of me, and always keep all my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Now listen, he knew it wouldn't always be that way with them. But that didn't mean God didn't have a call. He knew that they would make idols. Didn't. By the way, he knew that Babylon would come too. The Assyrians for the northern kingdom. He knew those things. How many of y'all going to sin tomorrow? Some hands went, amen, Ethan. Appreciate it, brother. I'll join you. I'll join you. You don't have to look at Patriot. She knows you're going to sin anyway. <laughs> That's just the way it is. But you're being honest. But God knows those things, but God wants to have an encouraging word to us to let us know that when we do, he's there for us. Even though he knows we're going to fail, Verse 32, therefore you shall be careful, does this sound familiar? To do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. I pray that sometimes, Bradley. Lord, if, if I edge over and I don't know it, if I move a, a one step to the right, bring me back to, to, to the plumb line. If I move to the left, Lord, tell me, remind me. Let me know so I can get back to the center of your truth. I don't want to wander too long. I don't want to stray. Verse 33, you shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you, that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. You shall possess. Do you hear this over and over again that God's making a promise, a covenant promise to his people? I'll be there. I know you're going to wander, but understand, I'm calling you to this. Every day I'm calling you to this. So then he places it before them. This is the commandment. These are the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you cross over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your sons, your grandsons, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. He's not thinking about one generation. He is praying for blessings for multi-generations, multi-generations, multi-generations. Church, 
we must get about the business of making sure that New Holland Baptist Church is multi-generational. Not just one. We must do for, not just for us, but we must make sure that we're doing, carrying this down, doing everything that the generations before us did for us. We're standing on their shoulders. But they're gone. Now they're going to have to stand on our shoulders. Therefore, verse 3, hear, O Israel. That's the term, Shema. Hear, listen, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here it comes, verse 4. Hear, O Israel. My prayer tonight is that we hear him not with our ears, but with our heart. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Just one. And you shall love the Lord your God. That you shall cherish the, the Lord your God. That you will see and look at God and know that there is nothing that can compare with him. And because of that, he is singular in your life. That is that there is no rival. That you cherish him more than anything else. As Jesus said in Matthew 13, you come and when you find that pearl of great price, you take everything you have and you, you sell it all so that you can come and purchase the one thing of value. Idols are only idols because we see value in them. In a moment, in a situation, in a point in time. That's a rival for God. When we bow the knee and we pray to a holy God in the beginning of the day, we should never find value in anything else. There are a plethora of things that we're going to do during the day. But they must always have the shadow of a holy God over them. No matter what we do, it should flow from a heart in love with a holy God. I'm going to give you a, a glimpse of next week's sermon. So all of you that are here will get a jump start on it. The word worship means to bow down and adore, right? We know that. We've said that over and over. But I believe in church, worship has meant to be the music. God help us. It's more than music. Worship is the expression of the Word of God. God help us. It's much more than that. Worship is our heart bowed down before God in everything we do. We can worship at Kroger. We can worship at the insurance office. And when I'm on TurboTax paying my taxes, I might have to work a little bit harder at it then. Might have to pray for a miracle or two. But everything that we do, every, in every conversation, it needs to be, I'm not saying you can't talk about something other than God, but I'm saying when you talk about Braves baseball and spring training coming up, do it that God is in control of that conversation. You're not going to say anything that God won't approve of. You need to make sure that your language is God-approved language. Amen? You need to make sure that, that when, when something is there that Christ would not agree with, that you do not amen that. When you get up in the morning and you get dressed, you need to dress in a way that Christ would honor that. You need to have your quiet time with God so that you can meet God there because God wants to meet with you. Every conversation, everything that we do, all of our recreation, there's nothing wrong with recreation. I'm not saying that we need to be a monk. When I went to South Korea, South Korea is one of the most Christian nations in all the world, and, and the pastor that I was with, by the way, I think I got the flyer. Y'all want to see my flyer? I, I found that in there this week. That we, that's in Korean, uh, and they call it a crusade over there. And if y'all you, can't see that, but I, I carry that thing around with me. That, that was a huge thing in my life that, that when I went over there. And, and they took me up this mountain because they wanted to honor me. And, and on this mountain, they would have these little places where the monks Hindu, 
monks were being there all the time. And at a certain time, they'd go and they'd ring the bell in the middle of this little building. And then they would sit down and they would do, work. They, they thought their whole life had to be sitting there in that uncomfortable position, reciting the same prayer over and over and over and over all day long, and then get up and ring the bell again. And, but I want to tell you, they had a heart to want to do that, but that's dead. I'm not saying that God's expecting you to, to, to find your prayer closet and stay in it 24-7. That's not what I'm telling you to do. It, but, but when you go to the funeral this afternoon because it's the right thing to do, why me, Lord? Then, then you do it for the honor and the glory of God. When I say that, why me, Lord, they, they may not know that's the song that you sang. So they may be saying, why is he saying, why me, Lord, going to a funeral? That was the song he had to sing this afternoon. But everything you do, make sure you're doing it for the honor and the glory of God. That's what he's trying to say. Worship can be done all day. Worship should be done all day. The prayer that begins doesn't need to be closed until the end. He says here before us that you may fear the Lord your God. Well, in verse number 5, he says, Love the Lord your God all your heart The longings of your life, the longings of your life, your soul, your being, who you really are when nobody else is around, that, that is here, your emotion. We need to be real with our emotion. God gave those things for us. Your strength, your passion. One of the things I love about church is uh, we have some people who've walked down many roads, many miles, and with that age has come wisdom. But I look over at Trevor, 26, praise God for passion. Praise God for passion. He drove an hour and 10 minutes to get here tonight. He drove an hour and 10 minutes this morning to come to church and then drove back home. And on a Sunday night, he drove another hour and 10 minutes to get back to church tonight. And he doesn't have that much gas money. But he's here tonight. Praise God for passion. Praise God for two teenagers. We got two teenagers here. I don't want to get the word out, but somebody came to know the Lord Wednesday night. Praise God for coming to, following, trying to do the right thing. I'm grateful we got wisdom. Amen? But may we never lose passion. And if the older people could somehow tap into the passion, and the younger people could somehow tap into the wisdom, we might have a hold of something. With all of our heart, our energy, our desire, our emotion, our being, our longing, with our strength, our passion. Really, he's saying, can you just bring it all here? People will follow that. People will remember that. Uh, I did go to the funeral this afternoon. Bradley, you did a good job. But... First time I heard Daryl Day speak was today. I don't know how old he is, but to me, he preached like a teenager up there today. He did, I thought, a very fine job. But the thing that made the biggest impression on my heart was he was preaching as fresh as anybody I've ever seen, speaking. What an opportunity. What an opportunity. Some of y'all know this Bible better than I do. But you go back for more because you want it to be fresh. You want it to be real. You've gone through difficult things, but praise God, you want more. You want God to be real 
in that moment. Now, please hear me. This is what heaven's going to be. This is one of the most beautiful descriptions of heaven that I've ever heard. When we get to heaven, we will stand before God and we will walk the streets of glory, loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, all of our thinking, and all of our strength. That's what we're going to do for every day of heaven. Amen? Oh, we're going to have a new body. I like that. Matter of fact, I don't know how much this body is a true reflection of me. My mother-in-law used to say she'd go in front of the mirror and see an old lady, but there was a teenager inside of her still. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all do. I don't know how much this frame is a representation of it, but I know my heart. And there are times that I want to do so much for God, and it's a struggle, and I want to speak, and I want to, I want to help. I want people to get it. I want people to understand love, and I want to beg them to the kingdom. I want to, I want to let them know that there's a God that cares. And it comes from this soul. And though I may fail in, that, in this world, really it's a proven ground for where I'm going to be. And there is coming a day that God's going to crack the nut, amen, and the real me is going to come out, and that's who I'm going to be in heaven. And I'm going to shout the streets of glory with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my thinking, with all of my mind, with all of my strength, and that's because that's who I am. But we're to be about God's business until we get there. So how do we grow in this? Well, he says, these words I command you today, verse 6, I command you today shall be in your heart. Teach them diligently to your children. I don't know that they're going to get it the first time or the tenth time. Or the 5,000th time. But teach them diligently. Don't stop. Talk of them when you sit in the house. When you walk by the way. When you lie down. When you rise up. Let your heart so shine. Not just your light. Your life. Every, let who you truly are shine in this world. It's a shame that our kids can't see the real us. Because we, we, want, we don't want them to see us vulnerable or all, all that stuff is silly. Verse 8, bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as a frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorpost of your house and on your gates. How radical are y'all willing to be? I mean, put the scripture up here in your forehead. I, I do... Put it on my arm. But if you're not careful, that'll just become another religious thing. I do that more for me than for others. I don't know how many other people see those things. But he says, make sure when you leave the house, you, you walk underneath that door. Like when the blood was applied over the lintel of the door, make sure you're walking under the, the word of God. The precepts and the principles of God. When you come home, Find your place. Find your oasis. Go everywhere. May it be everywhere. I don't do it anymore. To my own detriment, when I was a young preacher, I had a sign on the front of my car that said, I love Jesus. Uh, I, I made a pact, and for years, I, I wouldn't wear a shirt that wasn't a, a Jesus t-shirt. I wore them everywhere. Wore them to the, wore them everywhere. Everywhere. It's not that I've become dignified. I just, I don't know why I quit doing it as much as I used to. But I think that our Christianity needs to be, I don't know that I have a good word for it. He means everything to our heart. We need to make sure that he's everything in our life. Verse 10. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which the 
You swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities, which you did not build. Verse 13, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him. Verse 15, the Lord your God is a jealous God. Verse 17, you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies, his statutes, which he has commanded you. He goes on to talk about all the promises, all the signs, and all the wonders. I guess the when I was a financial planner years ago, uh, one of the things that they pounded into us was, you know, you're, you're getting monies and you, people would give you $100,000, however much they would give you, and you would invest it for them. And they said, make sure in no way, shape, form, or fashion that you ever co-mingle, <coughs> co-mingle federal crime. And I think he's bringing this to this point that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're here living this heaven life now. But make sure that your attraction for the world does not overcome your love of God. Go have fun. Work hard. Do the things that you do, do, that you do. All those things are good. I've been to Gary and Cheryl's house. They showed me their basement. I got the Coca-Cola thing down there. That's a cool place. I like that. You've done a great job. That's not sin. That's a great thing. But when you're down there and you're having your quiet time, enjoy it. Make sure that it's covered with a heart that loves God. By the way, they're going to open up their house for a small group. And they're going to invite their people over. And they're going to do a, a God work. That's going to be a holy chapel under the Lord. And Coca-Cola is going to be down there. <laughs> There's a message in there somewhere. You hear what I'm saying? How come we've become a secular people who meet together in church instead of being a godly people that goes out into a secular world? How come we've swapped? Am I the only one that feels this way? The thing about the Shema is God's telling us to listen. Hear what he has to say. So my word to you tonight is, I'm not saying listen to me, but I'm saying hear what he has to say to you. When you wake up in the morning, thank God, begin your day with him. By the way, let me back up. Before you go to bed tonight, get out your gratitude list and write down the things that you're grateful that God's done in your heart today. Before you do anything, before you say goodnight, write on your gratitude list. How many of you got one? My hands are going up more. I'm get, if I keep doing this, I'm going to have a whole church full of people doing a gratitude list. Thank God for what he's done. It'll help you on your low days. Get up tomorrow and say, Lord, I don't know what we're doing today, but we're going to do it together. Walk with me. May I have eyes to see as you see. May I have ears tuned into you to, to, to hear what you have to say. Lord, I want your yes to be my yes. I want your no to be my no. Lord, I want your words to be the words that I meditate on. I want my conversation to be holy unto you. And whether I'm talking about work, whether I'm talking about play, whether I'm talking about anything else, Lord, I want it to be that you are such as much a part of that conversation that you could join us at any time. Not commingle with the world, but totally given to God in everything that we do. Everything that we do. So if you got an egg route, a little Debbie route, go do it in Jesus' name. Amen? What I want us to do, we're not going to do a formal invitation tonight. But what I want us to do right now is in the quietness of this moment, I want you to just bow your head and talk to the Lord. First thing first, make sure you tell him right now, 
how much you love him. Now ask him if there's any area if, in your life where something has come and become a rival. To show it to you right now. Maybe it's just beginning to be a rival. Now ask him to help you to have the heaven walk even while you're here on earth. That you will do your best to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Father God, I know that there are people in this building tonight that are hurting, that are struggling, that are yearning for you, longing for you, desirous of your will. Father, you've heard their prayers. You love them. Some of them are praying for their children. Some of them are praying for their grandchildren. Hear their prayers and answer, O oh Lord. Lord, you are a patient and long-suffering God. But Lord, bless them. Anoint them. Give them endurance. Give them passion. Help them to walk with wisdom. Pray we have a God Monday, Lord. May we have a God Monday. Thank you, O oh Lord, for walking with us on a beautiful Sunday. Thank you for these people because they love you so very much. Bless them in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.